Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to Friends of Europe and to this conversation with Ambassador Power. My name is Giles Merritt. I'm the Secretary General of Friends of Europe. And um, should, should the conversation falter, I have one or two questions I'd like to throw into the, uh, into the pod. Um, I'm going to ask General Patrick de Roussier, the chairman of the EU Military Committee, to say a few words of introduction. But before that, I just want to signal one or two things. Uh, the first, Ambassador, is that there is a wonderfully heterogeneous audience in front of you, um, representing so many different facets of the the sort of rather hybrid political creature that Brussels is. So you, you've got NGOs, people from NATO, European Parliament, a lot of journalists. Um, and if possible, uh, I want to give some time to, to, to questions from them. I also want to um, perhaps sort of uh, signal in advance a, a question, a curiosity on my part, and that is, you're going to talk about peacekeeping. And I want to know what we mean by peacekeeping nowadays. It seems to me to have become so complex. And in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, and with the Ukraine crisis opening out in front of us, I can't help wondering what we mean by peacekeeping. It used to be outreach to sub-Saharan Africa and so on, which Europe was good at. After the Arab Spring, and especially the Libya operation, isn't there a strong sense of, you broke it, you own it, uh, as in an antique shop. Um, so I, if at some point you can talk a bit about what peacekeeping actually is nowadays in this highly volatile new security picture, I think that would be very useful. And I'd also like to tempt you into talking a bit about the Europeans, because although militarily we tend not to pull our weight, in peacekeeping terms we do. But on the other hand, we do tend to march a bit out of step. So European unity is a bit of a problem, I suspect. And I, I'd encourage your views on that too. But anyway, so much for my curiosities. Let's, uh, let's turn to General de Roussier for an introduction and then go straight into your remarks, Ambassador. Madam, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you today Ambassador Samantha Power. I'm not sure you need to be introduced, but it is my great honor to do so. You are the United States Permanent Representative to the United Nations and an eminent member of President Obama's cabinet. Excellency, you began your career as a journalist, and like us, the military, you have been deployed in the early stages on the ground, reporting from places such as Bosnia and Kosovo during the crisis in the Balkans, but also from East Timor, Rwanda, Sudan, and Zimbabwe. You are also a talented writer, and your second book, A Problem for Hell, America and the Age of Genocide, won the Pulitzer Prize. For some time, and particularly as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for multi Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights at the White House, you have a powerful voice on issues relating to democracy, human rights, human dignity, promotion of religion's freedom, and last but not least, reform of the United Nations. Today, it is a great pleasure to welcome you for this address to the Friends of Europe audience in Brussels. The topic you have chosen highlights the UN global efforts to strengthen peacekeeping and will lead up to the celebration of the 70th anniversary in September. The European Union is and will always be a strong supporter of the UN. We are natural partners and we are making a real difference for people all around the world. However, as you recently said in your remarks at Yale University, we are living in a time of daunting and perpetual crisis. Yes, the world is changing. We are confronting many challenges, multiple crises, and we must be ready for change. 
As chairman of the European Union Military Committee and personal military advisor to the High Representative of the European Union, Madame Federica Mogherini, I would like to mention three points where we are together involved in peacekeeping. Firstly, over recent years, the European Union has stepped up its engagement with the UN significantly and has been working in various fields in order to enhance EU common security and defence policy support to UN peacekeeping. Secondly, the UN Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, Ambassador Hervé Letsou, participates in the Minister's meeting on a regular basis and in the EU Military Committee meetings, which I chair at Chief of Defence level, and just highlighting our eagerness to exchange views on our mutual cooperation. Thirdly, EU military operations have been in support of UN missions for more than 10 years through operations U4RD Congo in 2006, but also through U4 bridging operation Chad RCA between 2008 and 2009, and currently through the ongoing bridging operation in the Central African Republic, to which you will go soon. So the EU and the UN are intensifying their collaborations. But let me now very shortly focus on the EU relationship with the United States of America in the area of military cooperation. Over the last years, cooperation has stepped up significantly. Just to highlight this, regular military to military interactions take place with US Africa Command and with the US European Command. In crisis management, the EU-US military cooperation has intensified, like in the fight against piracy in the Indian Ocean, but also in the area of training Somali troops. But there are further areas of common interest, like the Sahel, Mali and the Gulf of Guinea. The EU is committed to further enhance practical EU-US security and crisis response management cooperation, particularly in addressing the crisis in Africa. In her keynote speech at Chatham House, Madame Mogherini recently said, the threats we face are complex and need to be addressed with the broadest set of international tools available. Yes, more than ever, we must continue working together to make peacekeeping work. Madame, it is a great honor to welcome you, and I, we, are very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Merci. Thank you, General. Uh, it is great to be back in Brussels. It goes without saying in 2015 that we live in a time of myriad crises. Conventional and unconventional, aggressive state actors and marauding non-state actors, nearby and far away. The United States and Europe have a vital stake in curbing conflicts beyond our borders. These conflicts can displace millions of people, upend markets, spill over into neighboring countries, and disproportionately hurt people who are already poor and marginalized. The instability created by these conflicts increasingly attracts violent extremist groups who seize upon the vacuum of authority to terrorize and abuse civilians. Battle-hardened extremists can use the territory they seize to plan more attacks, increasingly relying on foreign terrorist fighters, thousands of whom carry EU or US passports and can move easily between conflict areas and our cities. And in a vicious cycle, the suffering caused by these conflicts can help propel individuals toward the violent ideology of extremist groups, as well as serve as a powerful recruitment tool. As you well know, few of today's crises stay contained within national borders. Of the more than 3.4 million refugees displaced by the conflict in Syria, more than 60,000 Syrians crossed the Mediterranean in 2014 alone. Italy spent $150 million in 2014 on its Mara Nostrum operation which was dedicated to patrolling the Mediterranean Passage and which saved thousands of lives. When the operation was deemed too costly for one country to bear, a more limited $40 million EU operation took its place, and in the last few months, nearly 400 migrants have died trying to cross the Mediterranean. We also have a moral stake in ending the suffering and atrocities endemic to these conflicts. 
Over the last century, many Europeans experienced firsthand the horrors of living under regimes that brutally violate human rights. We don't want to live in a world where people drown at sea while fleeing abuses like those committed by the Assad regime. We don't want to live in a world where Sudanese soldiers can rape more than 200 women and girls in Darfur with impunity, as they are alleged to have done last October in the town of Tabit, or where Yazidi and Assyrian Christian men and boys are rounded up and executed by ISIL simply because of their faith, and women and girls sold like animals in open auctions. And we don't want to live in a world where a girl believed to be as young as seven years old is used to set off a suicide bomb in a market in northern Nigeria, killing herself and seven other people. I'm going to speak today about the ways in which the United States and Europe need to pool our resources and capabilities to address today's threats. And I'm going to emphasize, in particular, the importance of strengthening UN peacekeeping. Given the costs of conflict and the strain of trying to tend to so many humanitarian emergencies at once, it bears repeating that we need to improve our ability to prevent conflict in the first place. Long-term investments in development are of course key. European governments like Norway, Sweden, Luxembourg, and Denmark are models of generosity, giving more development aid relative to their size than any other countries in the world. Nonetheless, while we know that countries that do a better job of educating girls are generally more peaceful, some 62 million girls worldwide are not in school. We have to change that. Mediation, good offices, and preventive diplomacy are also vital weapons in our prevention arsenal. And it is notable that European governments provide two, excuse me, three quarters of the United Nations extra budgetary funding for these tasks. European leaders have also been at the forefront of efforts to seek a political solution to the Ukraine crisis, while European diplomats, Bernardino Leon in Libya and Stefan de Mistura in Syria, have put their own safety at risk to try to broker an end to needless violence. For diplomacy to work, we also need to raise the costs on those who escalate violence or pose a threat to international security as the United States and Europe have done by ratcheting up sanctions on Russia for continuing to fuel deadly violence in eastern Ukraine. Tough multilateral sanctions on Iran have also played a critical role in bringing Tehran to the negotiating table to work toward a comprehensive plan aimed at preventing the country from acquiring a nuclear weapon. Crucial as these tools are, however, there are conflicts that cannot be resolved by mediation or solved by humanitarian assistance. Even though education investments can help prevent the rise of violent extremist groups, when Boko Haram abducts hundreds of schoolgirls, it underscores how dependent these educated kids are on basic security and how irreconcilable certain armed actors are. In those instances, the international community may have to resort to military force. And we, and by we I mean here, the United States and Europe, must each have the capacity and the will to do our fair share in marshalling that force. To be clear, I am not advocating the use of military force in the place of the other tools in our shared toolkit. Even when military action is necessary, such as against ISIL, it cannot be the only or even the primary component of our response. We have to counter the messaging of violent extremist groups and social media, cut off the flow of foreign terrorist fighters, and lift up the voices of Muslim leaders who preach a different message. We also know that without inclusive governance that allows citizens to hold their leaders accountable, military efforts will not succeed. Indeed, it is our military leaders who constantly stress the limits of using military force. The United States looks to Europe as a strong military partner in our efforts to address the range of threats we face today. That starts with NATO. NATO has been the bedrock of our transatlantic security for more than 60 years, and in President Obama's words, is, quote, the strongest alliance the world has ever known, end quote. That cannot and will not change. We must keep NATO strong, not only to ensure 
the territorial integrity of each and every member state, but also to confront rising perils that NATO's architects could never have imagined, like those emanating from violent extremist groups. Beyond NATO, European military force can be brought to bear in other ways, in service of our shared peace and security. A country may choose to deploy troops outside of a formal institutional arrangement, as a number of European countries, Denmark, France, the Netherlands, Spain, the UK, and others are doing today as part of a 60-nation coalition against ISIL. Acting in support of African-led efforts, France has also deployed troops under its own flag in Mali in 2013 and again in the Central African Republic later that same year. As President Hollande has said, the Mali intervention was recognized globally as, quote, useful for Mali, useful for the Sahel, useful for the fight against terrorism, and useful for security and peace in the world, end quote. And while horrific atrocities have been committed in the Central African Republic, the bloodshed would likely have been much worse had the French not stepped in to support African troops on the ground. A country may also choose to provide military support under the auspices of the European Union. The EU has deployed several targeted missions, including 700 troops who help protect the Central African Republic's main airport, a key hub for humanitarian supplies, where thousands of people also took refuge. 600 troops who are now helping keep the peace in Bosnia, and 1,200 sailors who protect ships and carry out counter-piracy operations off the Horn of Africa. Since 2007, the EU battle groups have offered rapidly deployable battalions of between 1,500 and 2,000 troops, which could make a critical contribution to international security. But the battle groups have not deployed in the eight years since they were created. That is regrettable, given the many worthy causes. And the battle groups are extremely costly. In the first six months of 2008, Sweden spent $130 million on its turn in the rotation. These rotations tie up thousands of troops who might otherwise be deployed in the field to save lives. Another means by which a European country can advance our collective security, and one I will argue today has a lot to offer, is UN-led peacekeeping operations. Some critics claim that UN deployments detract from NATO's core mandate or missions. Others claim that the United States does not respect these deployments or views them as soft. Both claims are false. The United States values Europe's military contributions to peacekeeping. NATO's current strategic concept itself calls for working with UN and regional organizations to enhance international peace and security. Blue helmets carry the unique legitimacy of having 193 member states behind them from the global north and south alike. In addition, these missions allow burden sharing. European nations can provide high value niche contributions and force multipliers to UN missions without having the burden of fielding the entire operation. A division of labor that both plays to European military strengths and spreads risks across a larger pool. And UN peacekeeping is the only mechanism that pays contributors, covering almost all operational costs for equipment and even defraying some personnel expenses. Now, I'm not here today to say which of the range of options I mentioned, governments deploying under their own flag through regional bodies or in UN peacekeeping missions, I'm not here to say which is the right fit for any particular European country or countries. We understand different organizations and configurations bring distinct advantages and disadvantages, which must be weighed on a case-by-case -case basis. But the United States and Europe each must find a way to do our fair share in protecting our common security interests. Today's UN peacekeeping is not your mother's peacekeeping. We are asking peacekeepers to do more in more places and in more complex conflicts than at any time in history. There are currently 16 UN peacekeeping missions worldwide, made up of nearly 130,000 personnel, including 90,000 troops and more than 12,000 police. This is compared to just 75,000 total personnel a decade ago. And that number does not include the more than 21,500 troops and 500 police deployed to the African Union-led 
peacekeeping mission in Somalia. This is far and away more peacekeepers than have ever been active in history. We're giving peacekeepers broad and increasingly demanding responsibilities in increasingly inhospitable domains. We're asking them to contain and at times even disarm violent groups, like the countless rebel groups in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're asking them to ensure safe delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance, such as by escorting emergency shipments of food and medicine to civilians, as peacekeepers have done in South Sudan. We're asking them to protect civilians from atrocities, as in the Central African Republic. We're asking them to bolster stability in countries emerging from brutal civil wars, as in Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire, as well as to prevent new outbreaks of violence in long-running conflicts, as in Lebanon. And in virtually all of these missions, we are asking them to carry out these duties in countries where governments are extremely weak and often struggle to meet the basic needs of their citizens. Today, two-thirds of UN peacekeepers are operating in active conflict areas, the highest percentage ever. Peacekeepers often deploy to areas where rebel groups and militia have made clear that they intend to keep fighting. And the warring parties in modern conflicts now include violent extremist groups who increasingly terrorize civilians and treat peacekeepers as legitimate or even desirable targets. Some say that we're asking too much of UN peacekeeping, but we are asking more of peacekeeping because today's threats demand peacekeepers play such a role. These new challenges and responsibilities are the reason that UN peacekeeping needs European militaries more than ever. European troops have extensive training, professionalism, and high-end equipment. European countries can also provide high-value niche capabilities like medical units, engineering companies, attack helicopter units, and teams to conduct intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR. UN peacekeeping would benefit exponentially from the kinds of contributions that European countries provided to the NATO-led mission in Afghanistan, ISAF. Four years ago, European countries had approximately 35,000 troops in ISAF. Today, that number has decreased to 2,000, freeing up troops who could make a tremendous difference elsewhere. Germans and Danes who piloted utility helicopters in Afghanistan, moving essential supplies and equipment across territory, could provide the same critical mobility assets to peacekeepers across large swaths of Darfur. Italians and Spaniards who ran military hospitals in Afghanistan could provide the same high quality medical care to peacekeepers combating violent extremists in Mali. Romanians and Czechs who protected ISAF bases by patrolling, manning checkpoints, and conducting cordon and search operations could do the same for UN bases in South Sudan where more than 100,000 displaced civilians have fled to UN bases for their lives. Beyond the direct impact of these contributions, greater participation by European militaries will also help improve standards and modernize systems within UN peacekeeping missions. To be sure, troops accustomed to the planning operations and logistics of their own militaries or NATO will find it challenging to adjust to UN systems as the Dutch and Swedes in the UN's Mali mission have experienced. That mission, for example, had to change key practices to accommodate an all sources information fusion unit and innovation created by NATO. But the UN mission in Mali adapted, and as a result, peacekeepers there now have improved military intelligence to counter asymmetric threats, and in this way, some of the inefficiencies in the existing UN machinery will get fixed from the inside out. Just as it will strengthen UN peacekeeping if European militaries play a greater role, so European militaries could also benefit. In ISAF, European troops hone their battlefield skills. Commanders gain tactical and leadership experience, and equipment was put to the test. Deployments to peacekeeping allow U European militaries to preserve this level of preparedness rather than allow it to degrade. Training and combined exercises like NATO's are extremely valuable and must continue, but there is no substitute for experience in theater. There is a reason the military dictum that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy 
is repeated so often. The benefits are no less significant for European police. By deploying to environments like Mali, where transnational criminal networks are smuggling drugs, weapons, and migrants, Europe's advanced gendarmeries could build investigative skills useful for eliminating similar networks at home. And because Europe is the ultimate destination for many of the illicit goods moved by these trafficking networks, dismantling them at their source would provide direct domestic benefits at home. 20 years ago, European countries were leaders in UN peacekeeping. 25,000 troops from European militaries served in UN peacekeeping operations, more than 40% of blue helmets at the time. Yet today, with UN troop demands at an all-time high of more than 90,000 troops, fewer than 6,000 European troops are serving in UN peacekeeping missions. That is less than 7% of UN troops. European police account for less than 4% of the UN's police forces. Now, that is not in any way to diminish the Italian, Spanish, French, and other troop contributions. These forces are currently risking their lives to keep a precarious peace in Lebanon, a mission to which Spanish Corporal Francisco Javier Soria Toledo gave his life six weeks ago. Nor is it to diminish the 130 Irish troops serving bravely in the Golan Heights. But it is to speak to the reality that European countries have drawn back from peacekeeping. What happened? As many of you know, a seismic shift followed the back-to-back -back catastrophes in Rwanda and Bosnia. In July 1995, Bosnian Serb forces seized the UN safe area of Srebrenica, where some 25,000 Bosnian Muslim civilians had sought protection under the UN flag. Fewer than 400 lightly armed Dutch peacekeepers were overrun by 5,000 heavily armed Bosnian Serbs, and at least 30 Dutch peacekeepers were taken hostage. When one Dutch peacekeeper tried to secure access to a bus so he could keep watch over the civilians who were being driven away by Serbs, the general leading the assault, Ratko Mladic, told him, quote, I'm in charge here. I'll decide what happens, end quote. And decide he did ordering the killing of more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys, the largest single massacre in Europe since World War II. The barbarous acts committed by the Bosnian Serbs in Srebrenica gutted the idea that the UN could keep people safe. The Dutch and most of Europe left peacekeeping 20 years ago not because of Srebrenica as such, but because Srebrenica laid bare a fatally flawed enterprise. Operations designed to monitor static lines of a ceasefire had been thrust into open war zones, and the consequences were deadly, both for the people who peacekeepers were supposed to protect, and, as was clear also when 10 Belgian peacekeepers were massacred by Hutu soldiers in Rwanda the year before, even for peacekeepers themselves. The few hundred UN troops in Srebrenica were outnumbered 12 to 1, outgunned and surrounded. They lacked clear orders as to whether they could use force to protect civilians, and they never got the air support they thought that they had coming. The fault lay with the system that put them in that position. At the root of the failures in Bosnia and Rwanda was a paralyzing and indeed dangerous confusion as to whether peacekeeping missions were authorized to use force to protect civilians under attack or whether their role was limited to self-defense. Perpetrators probed this line and brazenly exploited peacekeeping's structural weaknesses and contradictions. Even if peacekeepers had been given more explicit direction to use force, which they were not, it is not at all clear that they would have had the capabilities to marshal it effectively. But peacekeeping since then has changed. Peacekeeping missions now have clear authority to use force and clear mandates to protect civilians. 20 years ago, no peacekeeping operations had an explicit responsibility to protect civilians. Today, 98% of peacekeepers serve in missions that do. Today, the challenge is ensuring consistent fulfillment of these new authorities and mandates. UN peacekeeping is stronger than it was two decades ago. To be sure, serious institutional challenges persist, including 
inadequate planning, uneven mission leadership and troop performance, breakdowns in command and control, and a set of rules around human resources and procurement designed for the conference rooms of New York and not the streets of Bangui. But while admittedly there is much that still needs to be fixed in peacekeeping, and the Secretary General has convened a high-level panel on peace operations to try to catalyze a new wave of reforms, peacekeeping has evolved since many European countries left it in the mid-1990s. UN peacekeeping has improved logistics and sustainment through its Department of Field Support. It has modernized supply chain and asset management. It has strengthened lines of communication with headquarters. It has created an inspector general function to evaluate candidly the UN's performance. It has introduced a capabilities-based reimbursement system for troops, and it has developed a far more integrated approach to crisis situations, drawing on military, police, and civilian tools. This is why, after several national inquiries into the breakdown at Srebrenica, after parliamentary hearings, and after a very difficult domestic debate, in late 2013, the Dutch government decided to make its most noteworthy contribution to UN peacekeeping since Bosnia, sending troops to Mali. Prime Minister Rutte wrote to the Dutch parliament, quote, we have learned the lessons from the past, end quote. He argued that unlike in Srebrenica, the nature of their deployment and the institutional framework of peacekeeping would ensure that Dutch soldiers would be able to fulfill their duties while protecting themselves. The prime minister recognized that to protect Dutch security, the country had to take on missions far from home. He said, quote, because of the terrorist threat, this conflict is not just a major problem for Mali, but it affects the entire region and the international community as well, end quote. The Netherlands has now deployed more than 450 UN peacekeepers to Mali. They did not pick an easy mission. The asymmetric threats posed by armed groups in the country's north make Mali one of the UN's most challenging engagements, a reality brought home by the vicious attack on a Bamako bar over the weekend in which five people were killed, and by yesterday's rocket attack on the UN base in Kidal, which killed a Chadian peacekeeper and two children who were living in a nearby camp. The Dutch contingent includes special forces, a 220-person intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance unit, a combined attack and support helicopter unit consisting of four Apache and three Chinook helicopters, and police and civilian experts. And others have joined the Dutch in Mali, including Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Finland. The peacekeepers are not just hunkering down on the base. They are venturing out daily to carry out their mission. Unfortunately, even as the world demands more of UN peacekeeping operations, and even as some European countries like the Netherlands are returning to peacekeeping, a deep imbalance in troop contributions persists. Low-income countries with per capita income less than about $1,000 per year account for around 12% of the world's population, yet they contribute 43% of the UN's troops. And while many soldiers from these countries have shown tremendous bravery and resilience, they are the first to say that they often lack the training and equipment for the circumstances in which they find themselves. Obviously, it is not the job of the United States or any government to tell European countries how to maintain peace and security. But it is essential that each of us does our fair share and to that end, let me tell you how the United States is doing our part. As we speak today, the United States has military personnel deployed to over 100 countries in every region of the world. Our 10,000 troops remaining in Afghanistan under Operation Resolute Support are committed to sustaining Afghan national security forces in support of the Afghan government and people. Throughout the Middle East, we are pursuing violent extremists in the region, both directly and through local partners and we currently have 2,600 troops serving in the Global Coalition to combat ISIL. In recent years, we have deepened our already strong security ties in the Asia-Pacific region, from deterring North Korean aggression to providing life-saving humanitarian aid following Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. Forward-deployed U.S. service members continue to provide for the collective security 
that has helped enable Asia's remarkable rise. Our forces in Africa are working with a broad range of partners, including many of you, to build stronger governance and defense institutions and professional capable military forces. We recently deployed 2,800 troops to Liberia to help stop the spread of Ebola, just as in 2010, we sent 17,000 troops to Haiti in the aftermath of that country's devastating earthquake. The U.S. Navy remains forward deployed 365 days a year to ensure that the world's vital sea lanes from the Strait of Malacca to the Strait of Hormuz remain open to global commerce and use by all. And finally, I don't have to tell this room that the United States' continued commitment to the collective security of NATO and peace and stability in Europe remains absolute. Another key part of shouldering our security burden is ensuring that each country takes on its fair share of the costs. The United States and our European allies have committed to dedicate to defense spending a minimum expenditure of 2% of our country's respective GDPs. Given the range and severity of the crises we face today, one could reasonably argue that even in trying economic times, that proportion should be higher. Yet only two allies are even meeting the benchmark, and most allies are reducing, not increasing, military spending. Given the threats that exist around the world, this is deeply concerning. The United States is no stranger to the pressures of austerity, as you all have seen from our vigorous and seemingly eternal domestic debates on spending. And like many European countries, we have been forced to endure significant military cuts, which President Obama is working to reverse, together with crippling reductions to social services. But the United States is cutting from a much bigger pie. We allocate nearly 4% of our GDP to defense spending. Our next closest ally spends around half that. And the United States is paying a disproportionate share toward defending our collective security including 75% of NATO's budget. This imbalance is not only unsustainable, it is dangerous. In his last policy speech in Europe, delivered at this very forum in 2011, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates urged European governments to boost their defense commitments, or at the very least to deploy more strategically their decreasing resources to prevent our security partnership from becoming what he called a two-tiered alliance in which a few countries bear the disproportionate responsibility for the security of many. Secretary Panetta delivered a similar message, as did Secretary Hagel after him. And you can expect Secretary Carter will too. The message has not changed because the imbalance persists, an imbalance that will put our collective security at risk. Now, I also made the case today, persuasively, I hope, that as each European nation chooses its approach for doing its part to advance international security, UN peacekeeping is an attractive option. It allows European troops with key niche capabilities to have an outsized impact, and it raises the quality of the entire enterprise at a time when we need peacekeeping to do more in more conflict zones than ever before. Given that I've made such a strong pitch for the value of deepening our commitment to UN peacekeeping, I'm sure a good number of people in this room are asking, why doesn't the United States do more for peacekeeping? Well, the short answer is that alongside the range of ways we contribute to international security that I've already mentioned, we are also deepening our involvement in UN peacekeeping. Recognizing the importance of UN command and control in, Central Africa, in the Central African Republic, Mali, South Sudan, DRC, Liberia, and Haiti, we have deployed small teams of military staff officers who don blue berets to support mission leadership. We provide extensive support for training, equipment, and airlift, whether that's equipping African troops deploying to Mali or rapidly airlifting Rwandan and Burundian troops into the Central African Republic at the start of the African Union peacekeeping operation there. We have just launched the African Peacekeeping Rapid Response Partnership, which will dedicate $110 million per year for three to five years to build the capacity of key African troop contributing countries so that they can deploy more rapidly to peacekeeping missions, an initiative in which we would welcome the participation of European countries. 
We're also doing more to share our unique knowledge of confronting asymmetric threats, like the ones peacekeepers are confronting now in Mali and Somalia. Lessons we learned, and many European governments learned, through more than a decade of war in Afghanistan, and of course, for us in Iraq. We are doing more to help peacekeeping missions make better use of advanced technology, such as counter IED equipment, which can improve peacekeepers' ability to project force and save lives. We maintain 1,400 troops in peacekeeping operations in Kosovo and Sinai. We continue to look for gaps that we are uniquely positioned to fill, such as by building base camps for the UN peacekeeping operation in the Central African Republic, which we have just done. And of course, we cover more than 28% of the costs of UN peacekeeping, more than $2.5 billion this year. President Obama views strengthening UN peacekeeping operations as a strategic priority for the United States. Back in 2009, he gathered the leading troop contributors to peacekeeping to thank them for their contributions and to solicit their thoughts on how the enterprise should be improved. In 2010, in his Nobel Peace Prize speech, he underscored that, quote, we must strengthen UN and regional peacekeeping and not leave the task to a few countries, end quote. And on the president's direction, last September, Vice President Biden convened a peacekeeping summit alongside the UN Secretary General and leaders from Japan, Rwanda, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and ministers from another 20 countries. The goal of that summit was to encourage new concrete commitments of support to missions, and indeed a number of countries stepped up notably. Sweden announced that it would deploy 250 troops to Mali to conduct intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Indonesia announced that it will more than double its deployment of troops to peacekeeping from 1,800 to 4,000. China announced that it will continue to expand its participation, already at more than 2,000 troops. China is now the 13th largest troop contributing country. Latin America stepped up, with Chile voicing a willingness to make vital contributions to support UN peacekeeping operations outside Latin America in Africa. Mexico announced that it would deploy troops to UN peacekeeping for the first time in 60 years, while Colombia announced an intent to contribute troops for the first time in its history. Regional leaders are rallying their neighbors to do more. The Netherlands recently hosted a meeting of European countries, and in the months ahead, Uruguay, Indonesia, and Ethiopia will each host senior level regional meetings in their respective regions to urge new troop and police commitments. Rwanda will host a senior level meeting focused on improving the protection of civilians in the field. And at the end of this month, chiefs of defense from almost 100 countries will gather at the United Nations in New York for the first time ever to discuss how to strengthen peacekeeping. Building on all of this momentum, I am pleased to announce today that this coming September in New York, on the 70th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, President Obama will convene a summit of world leaders to help catalyze a wave of new commitments. It is in the interest of the United States and Europe to leave UN peacekeeping more capable, more nimble, and more reliable than it has ever been. The coming summit will take significant steps to strengthen peacekeeping, including by addressing three core needs that the United Nations has identified. First, the UN needs countries to help it close the enduring gaps that hamper existing peacekeeping missions. The peacekeeping operation in Mali is still short two C-130 aircrafts that could transport troops and equipment across theater. The operation in the Central African Republic is still short attack helicopters that could reinforce infantry and help protect civilians. These are intolerable gaps and just a taste of the shortfalls today that are undermining mission performance around the world. Second, the UN seeks to generate a set of rapid deployment commitments of troops and police that the UN can call upon if a new crisis erupts. Rapid deployment is critical to stemming emerging crises. The earlier we act, the better our chances of preventing full-blown conflicts and the more lives we can save. Yet today, rapid deployment is rare. To give just one example, in South Sudan, the Security Council rightly authorized an emergency increase in troops to stem violence in December 2013. Yet a year later, with civilians still in crucial need of UN protection, 
the peacekeeping operation was still more than 2,000 troops short. For European countries, committing to rapid deployment would not require special arrangements or dedicated troops as EU battle groups do. European countries demonstrated in Lebanon in 2006 that they can deploy troops to UN peacekeeping on very short notice. And these rapid deployment contributions would be for a finite period of time, allowing European troops to move quickly, establish a robust presence, and then hand off to the next wave of troops. Third, the UN must generate a broader set of troop and police commitments that could be called upon to staff future missions or backfill contingents that are leaving current missions. UN peacekeeping needs a deeper bench and a more capable one with skills to match needs on the ground. Some European governments may balk at the prospect of making a forward-looking pledge of troops and police, but the UN is not act asking for automatic or self-executing personnel commitments, but rather a pledge that a country is willing to make available capabilities and troops on a mission-by-mission -mission basis, retaining the future freedom of decision-making that any leader would need. We can strengthen peacekeeping in other ways, contributing technology and helping build capacity of some of the leading troop or police contributors. But progress towards the UN's three core goals is critical to ensuring that the institution can achieve what we and the world are asking of it. Peacekeeping has changed a great deal since most European countries left. Deployments are more robust and peacekeepers have clear mandates to protect civilians. But failures like the one last year in the Congolese town of, of Mutarule, where UN peacekeepers stayed on their base while more than 30 people were massacred a few kilometers down the road, are still too common. These failures persist in part because some peacekeepers still question whether it is their job to protect civilians. But those holding this view are increasingly in the minority. More peacekeepers are embracing their core responsibility to keep people safe, with African countries like Rwanda and Ethiopia taking a leading role. And yet, in spite of this important evolution, UN peacekeeping operations often lack the full complement of capabilities to make these aspirations a reality. That is where European troops could help the most, providing niche assets to make peacekeeping operations more effective. Infantry troops can do more preemptively if they have good military intelligence on threats to civilians. Peacekeepers can take greater risks if they can count on high quality medical support. Troops can patrol more actively if they know attack helicopters stand behind them. In early January, a platoon of Bangladeshi peacekeepers in Mali moved into the northern town of Tabankort with the aim of preventing fighting between hostile armed groups and protecting local civilians. As tension mounted, another Bangladeshi platoon reinforced them and civilians took refuge in their camp. On January 20th, rebels advanced on the town, opening fire on the peacekeepers. The Bangladeshi troops held their ground, returned fire, and called for helicopter support. The Dutch peacekeepers, who had arrived in Mali only weeks earlier, swiftly responded to the call, striking the rebels with an attack helicopter unit and ending the assault on the town. This is what a modern European contribution to a 21st century UN peacekeeping operation looks like. Targeted, effective, momentum shifting. Beyond deterring individual attacks, such interventions demonstrate the force multiplying effects that Europeans bring to operations. The willingness to repel an attack makes other peacekeepers, like the Bangladeshis deployed to Tabankort that day, more confident in holding their ground because they know that the Dutch have their backs. Irrespective of which country they come from, blue helmets who fail to fulfill their mission undercut the enterprise of peacekeeping. Like Mladic at Srebrenica, <coughs> warlords, militia, and violent extremists start to believe that they are the ones in charge. Emboldened, they are more likely to carry out brazen attacks on peacekeepers and to abuse civilians. But acts of determination, like the Dutch and their Bangladeshi partners in Tabankort, also have resonance beyond individual incidents. 
They inspire confidence and build camaraderie. They help bring respect to the blue helmet. And they shift the balance of who is in control on the front lines of the world's conflict zones. That is a balance worth shifting, and it is one in which European military's participation can be decisive. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador Parr. Um, I'll come to the hands in a minute. It, it's clear you've, you've opened a really interesting debate on the future of European peacekeeping efforts, <coughs> whether or not European troops should be wearing blue helmets much more than in the past, and how Europeans and United States military can cooperate more closely. It'll be interesting also to see whether the debate you're opening somehow gets mixed up with the debate that Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission, has just started to, uh, to mention, which was the rather unexpected idea of reopening the 60-year-old debate about whether there should be a European army. So I, I can see some very happy debating times ahead as the, as the head of uh, your Friends of Europe, which does a lot of debating. Um, let's group up the questions and let's ask for people to identify themselves and keep their questions really short. Okay, we'll start at the front and work back. And then Hi, over there. Ambassador Terry Schultz with National Public Radio and CBS. Um, I was, I'm going to uh, follow up on what Giles said. Um, with uh, President Juncker um, saying that he would like the EU to look again at establishing a new army, do you think, given what you've just uh, explained to us, that this would be a useful, um, a, a useful uh, pursuit for, for the European Union, or would you like to see them, instead of establishing a new army which may or may not duplicate NATO's role, s put more into, into the missions that you have described here? Okay, thank you. I'm going to group up three, I think. Let's take this lady behind. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ambassador Power, uh, Lawrence Norman of the Wall Street Journal. Can you just be specific? Do you want the EU to return to the levels that it had 20 years ago in terms of peacekeepers, I think you said 40% of total troops. And I think you said the 2% goal may not be high enough for defence spending. What do you think it should be? Thank you very much. And just in front here, this lady here. Ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Ambassador Powell, thank you very much for drawing our attention on that what's happened in Srebrenica. On 11th of July, it's going to be exactly 20 years when the worst genocide after the Second World War happened in Europe, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. However, we are strongly supporting key missions we think we are participating in them, and we think that uh, uh, much more people, much more countries should give uh, whatever they can in order to strengthen participation. But the question which I have is, after Srebrenica, people are still uh, struggling to locate and to bury the dearest one. And the truth about genocide has been denied even in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in, in relatively large part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So what, after peacekeeping missions, what we can do? How long we have to wait to normalize situation, even with the fact that we are willing and we are participating in peacekeeping missions? On the other side, Master, we have keep that very yeah, short? Yeah. On the other side, we have a real problem. We are not a member of MEP, we are not a member of NATO. So how small nation as uh, people of Bosnia and Herzegovina, as Bosnian people, can really go forward? And I think it is not a question which is applicable only to us. It is a question which is going to be applicable to all those countries where peacekeeping operations are taking place. Thank you. Thank you. As a mixed bag. Okay, it works great. Um, thank you all. Uh, 
And thank you for listening to such a long speech. Um, let me take the, the questions in turn. Uh, I think that the, um, I would caution against uh, an emphasis on, uh, on form over substance, at least for, certainly for me. I described uh, in my remarks the centrality of NATO to international peace and security, not only for 60 years, but going forward, particularly as new threats loom relatively close to home here uh, in Europe. Um, I described EU an EU deployment that took some time to get off the ground to the Central African Republic, but ultimately made an important difference. And indeed, the general just learned that the general's son is in the Central African Republic as a, as a medic, providing medical support to peacekeepers and to uh, local people. So the European Union, uh, again, when it can uh, gather, coalesce, decide upon a mission and, and, and gather resources from across the continent uh, can make a very, very important di difference. Um, and then of course you have examples like the French in Mali and in the Central African Republic operating under their own flag uh, similar to the way that the United States, you know, did uh, in Haiti uh, after the earthquake, and that's uh, a way of doing it too. I think the the issue is not so much which form, but rather uh, our countries maintaining the capabilities in tough economic times. Are they mustering the political will? Can they mobilize domestic support? Uh, the certainly uh, the threat environment. Uh, and particularly as threats uh, migrate to Europe, as we've seen with a number of attacks just in the last six months, um, you know, should uh, provide important reminders of the importance of dealing uh, with these kinds of crises at their source. Uh, but as yet, we have not seen uh, that threat environment translate into an increased allocation of resources. and uh, and that it, it, notwithstanding the fact that troops and police are coming home from Afghanistan and that might free up uh, additional resources to deploy in other missions in other ways, uh, we aren't seeing yet, uh, at least, and unless others want to uh, perhaps educate me here uh, on my trip to Brussels, there's nothing visible yet uh, that would indicate that that is happening. And then of course I mentioned peacekeeping, and I'll then go to the second question, uh, as another venue where uh, European countries are already contributing a huge share of the peacekeeping budget um, could make, uh, use their unique capabilities, make relatively modest, I mean, I, the Dutch intervention that I've described is 450 troops, modest contributions that can have catalytic effects on the whole, on the whole mission. And that's what this effort that the UN is undertaking this year to enhance uh, the capabilities it has at its disposal to get more advanced militaries, more sophisticated militaries involved in peacekeeping. Um, and I, in terms of the, again, the question uh, from the Wall Street Journal, I would only note that the 2% marker which we have agreed upon is a consensus commitment. Um, but as I mentioned, it's, I believe, only been met by uh, two allies, again, apart from, from the United States. So I don't, it's probably, not productive to talk about what it should be in some abstract world. This is an important figure, uh, and again, one that was embraced uh, by by all leaders. And again, irrespective of which of these different venues one chooses to uh, contribute to or contribute through, um, at the core, uh, it's each country and what it does within its national military or policing, for that matter, framework that is going to dictate how much it has to contribute, whether through the EU, through the UN, or um, you know, acting under its own flag or in a coalition like that against ISIL. Finally, on uh, Srebrenica, um, I would only say that on the genocide denial, that denial says a lot more about the denier than it does about the facts of what happened uh, 20 years ago. It is a very somber anniversary approaching, um, and mercifully, there's been a period of relative peace, but of course, underlying issues uh, among the parties in Bosnia, many of them yet unaddressed, uh, and they need to be addressed. Um, I, I think that uh, the 20-year marker will be an occasion where 
the deniers will feel more and more isolated as dignitaries travel from all around the world. I was there on the 10 year anniversary and the 15 year anniversary and it's an extremely moving event and it really is a time where people sort of, uh, you know, place themselves back in that moment of, of uh, such a collective failure on behalf of your people. And finally, to your question about how can a small country contribute, I mean, I think what I've described uh, about these mo modest or niche investments applies also to, to small countries. I mean, Bosnia has its own challenges and its own internal uh, security issues that it is still working through 20 years after the war. Um, but whether it's police officers or, again, staff officers who can help in command and control, people who have experience in demobilization or security sector reform, which still, again, has a ways to go, but has come a long way in 20 years, that kind of technical expertise, it doesn't matter how large you are, that's what UN missions need around the world. And so I think actually countries that have come out of conflict, uh, depending on the individuals, can have a great deal to offer. Thank you. Please, please, let's, let's take three more. Yeah, yeah, please. A very short time. Huh? Yeah, it will be, Giles, don't worry. Uh, Brooks Tegner, uh, Jane's Defense and Security Europe. You said that the EU and the US need to look at, quote, ways to pool our resources to address today's threats, unquote. To me, that suggests something bilateral across the Atlantic between the two sides. Is that what you meant? Uh, and if so, what would that be? Or did you simply mean that each side should funnel more to the UN? Thank you. Thank you. Just behind you and then over there. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Mohamed Rajai Barakat. Very quickly, I want to ask you, Excellency, uh, in some uh, think tanks here in Brussels, many experts are speaking about uh, the so-called Islamic State as a real state, uh, a real state with uh, land, uh, people, money, and uh, do you think that one day uh, European and USA are going to discuss and negotiate with this so-called state? And uh, some, some, some of these people, Daesh, uh, are speaking about uh, uh, Mecca and Medina in, in Saudi Arabia, and that an Islamic state cannot be built without Mecca and Medina. Do you think that Saudi Arabia is going to be uh, touched or concerned by this uh, issue? Thank you very much. Thank you. Over there, last one. Uh, I uh, Francesco Guarascio Reuters. Um, do you think uh, the EU should uh, lead a uh, UN mission in, uh, in Libya and um, how quickly should be deployed? Uh, should be um, after a deal is reached among uh, warring factions in Libya or even before? Thanks. Okay, let's take those three, Ambassador. Okay, um, with regard to the first question from Jane's Defense Weekly, I. Uh, I tried to articulate in my remarks the, the, the range of uh, ways in which the, the contributions would occur, so I'm not, not exactly sure uh, what bears repeating. Um, the idea of pooling resources means contributing uh, more uh, in terms of ensuring preparedness for each of our uh, militaries. That's again why President Obama is fighting the sequester, uh, both on the military side and the social services side. It's why we think the 2% target needs to be met. Um, and then, again, well, I'm, as I've said, I think, three times in the speech, I'm, I'm not here to, on behalf of the United States, to, to tell any particular country what's in its interest to do. I think these are all case-by-case -case decisions, but they're, the, the, the nature of the threats are such that more is better and more capabilities of uh, the kind that Europe brought to bear in Afghanistan and is now bringing home uh, can be extremely valuable and can help over time prevent the kinds of threats that we've seen metastasizing uh, that can help those threats from, from migrating, again, beyond national borders. Um, I, I do want to underscore, because inevitably we're, we're speaking a lot about the military piece of this. I mean, I chose to give a set of remarks about um, military contributions. But I do want to re <laughs> reaffirm what I said at the beginning, which is if all we were talking about were military contributions, this whole enterprise would be doomed uh, because you have to have multiple lines of effort. And if you look at why, to get to the second question, the Islamic State 
um, was able to uh, pick up speed and um, take the territory it did, it was in part because it was a fertile ground because of the alienation uh, that Sunni in Iraq felt uh, from the government, the sense of exclusion and so forth. So governance is key, humanitarian assistance is key, again, the messaging, the financing, border security. I mean, all of these warrants a speech in its own right. Um, and it just happens that I'm emphasizing uh, the military piece of it and particularly the military, the potential for military contributions within the United Nations. Um, in terms of uh, the threat posed by the Islamic State, I think it, it uh, poses a threat uh, to the region, of course, and that would include Saudi Arabia, uh, not just because of the, the, the rhetoric or the stated aspirations of the, of the Islamic State, but also just because of the nature uh, of, again, people who are fighting in Syria and Iraq and then uh, traveling to other countries and um, uh, who've made clear their uh, intention uh, to take the fight well beyond the territory that they control at present. I would note that the coalition, thanks again in part to the contributions uh, of many European governments, is chipping away at the territorial control that ISIL uh, obtained in the early months uh, of their sort of onslaught. Uh, and in addition, the sources of uh, revenue, like the oil fields and the, and the refineries and so forth, uh, are many of those, most of those have been uh, destroyed. And so I think you're gonna see a steady degradation, but as President Obama and most European leaders have made clear, it's going to take uh, some time. And then finally, on the question about Libya, right now our emphasis is very much on supporting uh, Bernardino Leone, who uh, has brought together uh, the House of Representatives, the government side on the one hand, and then of course, uh, the GNC, uh, things are progressing. It's extremely fragile, extremely difficult. Um, and we have heard him and others say that they may, on the back end of uh, any kind of creation of a national unity government, they may uh, request the presence of, of peacekeepers. Um, I would note that uh, even though I described in Mali and uh, in South Sudan some and Central African Republic some very difficult operating environments, I think it's very important to note that fighting ISIL is not a peacekeeper's task. I mean, these lines are getting blurred up to a point, um, and I think Mali is one that straddles uh, both the sort of tradition, not, not traditional, but the, the, the kind of modern uh, peacekeeping role where there's not officially a peace to keep, that a political process is happening in train a lot, right alongside the effort to protect civilians. You have that on the one hand, but you also have Al-Qaeda affiliates and others and that's what has made it a, a very challenging mission and has made, uh, again, the intelligence and other resources that the Dutch have supplied uh, so important. Um, so Libya too, I think one has to, there's the national unity government on the one hand and then there's the ISIL uh, issue, which is a discrete threat, very much like the threat that we see in Iraq and Syria. And so um, that's going to require a discrete, uh, it does require, is requiring a discrete response. Uh, finally, on the, Peacekeeping force, I would just note that um, from uh, for, for many years now, um, Libyan uh, political figures have been ambivalent or divided, let me put it that way, about an the question of an international presence. And so one of the things that Mr. Leon will be, um, will need to sort of uh, get into as he talks to the parties is what is the, alongside a national unity government, if you can get there, what is the will of the parties with regard to an enforcement mechanism on the backside? Um, because foisting something on uh, you know, a set of uh, unwilling parties uh, would require you know, an enormous uh, military uh, commitment. Can you manage just a few more short ones? We've totally neglected this side of the aisle. Let's, let's start with this gentleman here and go there and there. Ambassador Power, good uh, afternoon. My name is Marius Wanders. I'm representing World Vision, therefore an NGO that uh, is very much involved in, in uh, uh, peace building operations. Now, we are talking peacekeeping operations here. Peacekeeping and peace building are, of course, different uh, issues altogether. The United Nations spends about 7 billion euro per year on these peace peacekeeping missions. And the United Nations only spends about 700 million 
dollars per year on peace building. Yet the rewards for peace building are uh, more sustainable, I would say, than of peacekeeping. Is there any way, in, uh, any views that you have on perhaps a joint effort led by the United States government and the EU to sort of redress that balance in investment in peace building as opposed to peacekeeping? Thank you. Thank you. Could you pass it forward to this gentleman here? Good afternoon. My name is uh, Serge Strubans and I work at the Belgian Royal Military Academy here in Brussels. Um, sometimes the Security Council is described as being a part of the problem rather than be part of the solution. Could you please elaborate on the possible reform of this, uh, this body, ma'am? Thank you. Thank you. And then that lady there. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, Jana Brovdi, Ukrainian think tank liaison office in Brussels. Um, how do we go about peacekeeping uh, when one of the members of the Security Council is assigned uh, to the conflict? Maybe just some of your ideas on the reform of the UN briefly. Thank you. Ambassador. Okay, thank you. Um, first on the uh, peace building question, I think one venue, uh, who, who asked the question again? Okay, there, sir, thank you. Um, the, right now we are um, feverishly trying to develop consensus on the sustainable development goals. And one of the uh, goals that was most important to us was uh, to, but two goals that have now ended up sort of a little more linked than we would have thought ideal, but conflict and governance. Um, and depending on what happens over these negotiations, conceivably, uh, where we land in September at the summit on these sustainable development goals may be a way to mobilize resources around particular targets within those goals. Now that the challenge right now, as some of you know, with the so-called sustainable development goal process, this is the inheritors to the Millennium Development Goals, so these would, uh, will kick in uh, in 2015 and, and look out another 15 years, um, is that the list of goals is much longer, at least at present, as they, than they were before, and there are concerns that thus efforts will be diluted. So we will need to work with our NGO friends and others um, to really highlight those goals around and those targets specifically uh, work together in the coming months, not only to to make sure that the, seek to make sure that the targets are implementable um, and measurable, uh, but then also, again, try to do the mobilization on the back end, but very specifically around this set of issues. And I can just tell you that President Obama agrees uh, completely with the premise of your question, um, and that's why, again, there's a slight, uh, selection bias and the fact that I chose to speak today about military force, but one could speak at great length um, about the development challenges. And then in the post-conflict period, every post-conflict period is a pre-conflict period as well, potentially. And yet that's when we, when the peacekeepers have left, steam sort of is let off and, and there isn't the same level of attention. Uh, in part, frankly, because of the nature of assessed dues and where the resources go. Getting peacekeeping missions, though, as they taper off to perform more of the civilian, the policing, the DDR, the security sector reform, that can also be part of that bridging period that's so important. Um, the second and third questions are similar, I suppose, um, in terms of Security Council reform. Uh, it is uh, very challenging uh, to sit on the Security Council with a country that is, uh, has attempted to lop off part of its neighbor <laughs> uh, because we're sitting on the Security Council um, with a stated mission of promoting international peace and security, not with a stated mission of lopping off part of your neighbor. Um, so uh, that is challenging. I, I will, very challenging. And um, it means that uh, the Security Council is much more limited, of course, in what it can say and do, though I would note that when um, President Putin attempted to uh, annex Crimea, uh, we mobilized, even though of course Russia vetoed the resolution, and that was to be predicted, uh, we did mobilize 13 and a half votes uh, against the annexation of Crimea, and the fact that China abstained 
on that vote rather than voting with Russia, I think was significant. We also, because the General Assembly is not blocked in the same way, we went to the General Assembly and 100 countries uh, voted against the, the Crimea annexation or the, the, uh, the idea of recognition and for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And that has an important tangible consequence because it means that that, is, that has the force of law within the United Nations and thus the maps uh, will not change and Crimea will remain uh, part of Ukraine. Um, and, and so again, over time, uh, hopefully we can, we can uh, make an impact for the people of Crimea who've suffered terribly since uh, the annexation, particularly as you know, the Tatars. Um, so that's in terms of Ukraine and something very close to home. On Syria as well, um, uh, it's been uh, really um, devastating to the credibility of the Security Council, devastating above all to the people of Syria, uh, that we have not been able to mobilize uh, consensus. Uh, there have been now four Russian vetoes of Security Council resolutions. Really only chemical weapons is the only issue on which, and we just had another vote last week, which was actually very important, that Russia was prepared to support a condemnation of chlorine use in Syria. So they, there's little pockets where you can eke out uh, cooperation, but the core issues in Syria, um, the Security Council, uh, because of the Russian vetoes, have, been, uh, have, n have not been able to address collectively. And, and that division, I think, is something that only the worst actors uh, take advantage of. In terms of reform, I think, certainly since I've been there, we've been trying to enhance the transparency of what we do, do more ARIA sessions and kind of informal dialogues and um, you know, bringing into our discussions and seeking to do more of this, the troop contributing countries who are putting their troops in harm's way. Uh, again, we need to get more systematic about that because they're very frustrated. They get handed these mandates and often have not had a, uh, a hand in shaping them. Uh, so these are kind of procedural reforms. The larger uh, question of Security Council reform, membership reform, um, uh, does not, it, it, there is a very live debate underway in New York because of the 70th anniversary. Uh, but the divisions among member states remain um, very, very significant from what I can tell. Now that may, at a moment's notice, it could give way and, and you know, certain proposals could gain momentum and we are again open to a reform proposal that does, uh, that in our judgment would enhance not just the representativeness of the Security Council, because we know that that needs to be more representative, um, but of course, also we're looking at the overall effectiveness of the body and not wishing to see more serious and more paralysis and so forth. Ambassador, thank you very much. Um, we've run 20 minutes past our allotted time. I'm, I'm getting what you might call diplomatic winks from the, the, the front row. So I'm going to thank you very much indeed for opening a really interesting debate. And I trust that as you crisscross the Atlantic and uh, the world, next time you come back through Brussels, we can welcome you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.